Janelle Wary, thank you so much yeah, for inviting me out to Purdue. Sure, this has yeah. been a great trip so far. You've yeah. been instrumental in putting it all together. So thank you. Yeah, thanks for coming. I'm really glad you were able to make it out here. Yeah. So um, where to begin? You're from Hawaii. Yes, I grew up in Hawaii. <laughs> Tell us about that a little bit. Um, yeah, so I uh, grew up in Hawaii, um, went to high school there, and, um, you know, always kind of wanted to go into science and engineering and when I was in high school, I went to this um, like camp thing for potential prospective engineering students cool. at the University of Illinois. And that was where I really got interested in nuclear. Yeah. So um, that was the path that I took. How did you know about that camp? Um, I honestly don't know. This was like before <laughs> the Internet. And um, so we must have gotten some sort of flyer or maybe Amazing. I heard of it through my school or something. Yeah. That's awesome yeah, how life yeah. will take you on the old right, paths. Right, right, yeah. So when you went off to school, did you know that you wanted to do nuclear? Um, I did. So, you know, the, the camp had really sort of focused my interest on nuclear a little bit. Awesome. Very um, progressive camp. Yeah, so yeah. So, you know, they kind of talked about each of the different engineering disciplines, right, yeah. at Illinois. And um, that, that was kind of what focused me on nuclear. Um, and so then I, you know, applied to universities that had nuclear engineering programs um, and ended up at Michigan, cool. um, finished my bachelor's there. So, and yeah. um, after that, what what aspect of the field? Did you yeah. So, in? you know, after my undergraduate, I was really kind of interested in power um, and I was interested in doing a PhD, but I didn't really know what I wanted to do the PhD in. Mm. So I went to work in the power industry. I was at Duke Energy for a couple of years. Cool. Were you doing core design? I was doing core design work for the Oconee nuclear station. Um, And, you know, through that job, I guess I sort of realized that all of the issues that the plant was having in terms of having to have excessive outages or um, basically having unnecessary shutdowns were all due to materials issues. Materials? You know? well, yeah. Why would materials cause these outages? Yeah. So, you know, oftentimes it was something like um, maybe a fuel pin leaking, mm. um, you know, could maybe something due And what's to, a fuel pin? A fuel is just, it's just one of those Just, just a long rods. rod, a rod with um, fuel pellets. They're, you know, it's about a centimeter or so high, uh, stacked up typically about 12 feet in height, right? Um, and if the chemistry of the water in the, the coolant water in the reactor, if the chemistry changes a little bit, you can kind of detect if you've got a fuel pin leaking, which means that right. the water is sort of coming, you know, in, in, in and interacting with that fuel, right? So, yeah, so a normal fuel uh, or a normal quarter reactor is a series of fuel assemblies, which are a set of these 12 foot long fuel rods, fuel pins yeah. that have a stack of, you know, pencil eraser sized little pellets in them, right? But there's a this like helium gap, I guess, between the pellets and the cladding of Correct. the rod. Correct. So what happens when there's a leak? Does water just rush into the rod? Um, so water won't uh, necessarily rush in. Um, but water can sort of trickle in there, <laughs> right? And um, it can cause interactions with the fuel okay. um, and s- some water fuel interactions can release a lot of the, the fuel particles or fission gases into the, the, the entire coolant water. Does it change the output of the reactor as well? Or do you really have to just do a chemical analysis to even know that this has happened? Um, so I don't know how detectable it is in terms of the reactivity and output of the power output of the reactor. I think if it's just like a couple of isolated rods, um, you can probably play with the power. To, I, I really don't know. So yeah. I, I'm not super confident talking about that. <laughs> and um, But you noticed that this was a problem. This is something you decided you wanted to pursue your studies into fix. Yeah. So, um, you know, just these sort of, interactions of the the reactor um, or of the fuel with material materials and um one of the other issues that we had um 
that we were exploring when I was there was um, replacing the type of cladding mm. on the fuel, um, replacing the type of control rod materials. And um, we we're doing some analyses in my group to try to understand um, the effects of the, the different type of cladding and the different mm. material of control rod. Um, on the overall reactivity since mm. I was in more of a core design type of role. That was kind of how we were looking at materials. What are your options with clad? Um, so typical cladding is zircaloy, a zirconium based alloy. Um, the type of alloy that we were thinking of changing to was an alloy called M5. Um, and it was, it's sort of just a slightly different composition, a slightly different um, sort of heat treatment and processing condition than still zirconium existing. though. It's still a zirconium based alloy, but mm. cool. Um, okay, so yeah, so you went off to study this, and yeah, so I went back to school to finish my PhD, um, and my research focus there really went into the materials and effects of radiation on materials. Yeah. And, what are the effects um, of radiation on materials? Yeah, so typically radiation um, causes a number of different effects. So most materials in a reactor are um, metallic or ceramic uh, fuels, for example, are, are ceramics. Most of the structural materials are metallic materials. And in all of these materials, um, they're, they are made up of atoms that are arranged on a crystal lattice. Mm. And what radiation will do is uh, be incident on this crystal lattice and knock specific atoms out of their lattice. And this is neutron radiation neutron specifically? Neutron radiation. Will neutrons, gamma ever knock things out of the lattice? Uh, gamma does not really have the effect of knocking stuff out. Um, ions, though, um, some electrons can have enough um, momentum to knock lattice atoms out of their positions. So. Mm -hmm. um, but primarily in, in a reactor, we're looking at neutron irradiation impinging on a target material, knocking atoms out of their positions. When that happens, that causes a whole cascade or mm -hmm. avalanche of other stuff. So mm -hmm. other things that can happen would be that those, those defects that are created um, they can either stay in the material. Um, some of them will sort of recombine and he self heal the materials, yeah. or if you will. Um, and then other defects will sort of clump together and form larger defects. So mm -hmm. that's how you can get stuff like dislocation loops and voids in the material. And these voids are basically just um, pockets of vacuum in your material. They're, you know, spherical type shaped, uh, vacuum filled. And um, those are really problematic because they sort of cause your material to swell up like um, almost like a sponge, you know, growing when you wet it, right? And how come they don't collapse back in on themselves? If they're vacuums and, you know, the original lattice structure wants to be in a certain position, yeah, how come it just yeah. doesn't reform? Um, there's enough surface energy of those, those voids. They have enough surface energy around them um, that they have sort of stabilized and equilibrated that that way um, in, in the, the material structure. Um, there's a whole host of different chemical interactions as well. And so um, because an alloy is made up of multiple elements, right? Some of those elements will preferentially want to form little shells around mm. those voids and that further stabilizes those voids. Right? Um, so you could potentially pre-dope a um, an alloy material with certain elements that, in the case of uh, atoms being displaced, as they reagglomerate, it actually creates a more stable structure. Um. Yes. Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. And that is one of the things that I think is we're sort of on the frontier of at this point in materials research in. The terms of being able to sort of intelligently design materials yeah. to be more resistant to radiation, yeah. right? We've, we sort of, at this point, know what radiation does to a material. And so now we can sort of proactively 
kind of take charge and design features into materials to prevent against uh, some of the more detrimental effects of radiation. Which are the materials that we are worried about or concerned with? Because in this high neutron environment, yeah. there are really only a few materials probably that we have to think about. We got the pellets themselves, mm-hmm. right? Uranium yeah. oxide, and then whatever they become as you build up with fission products. You've got your zirconium cladding. You don't have to worry about the water because the water doesn't need to maintain structural support. Right. And then you've got, uh, what, stainless steel Steels. as your... And then maybe another the layer of steel after. Yeah. Yeah. Steels. And then on the secondary side, you have a, uh, you have a lot of um, nickel alloys in the uh, turbines and high temperature. Are those subject to neutron irradiation? They're not really subject to neutron irradiation, but they're subject to a lot of extreme temperature environments, mm. right? And, and that causes, there's a lot of corrosion issues um, associated with high temperature steam water exposure, right? Mm. So, um, and that's because oxygen likes to attack things. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But as far as irradiation environments, yeah. you're right. It's the fuels, um, the clad, and then mostly, you know, steel, 304, 316 stainless steels, and then the pressure vessel, which is typically a low alloy steel. Yeah. So. So we've got, you know, hundreds of these guys operating for (laughs) decades at this point. So we must know a lot about, if we don't exactly know exactly what's happening on the atomic level, we have a lot of practical data as to how these things perform. And I'm sure we've been able, as we decommission things, to cut them up a little bit and put them under a microscope and see what's going on. So what are are our concerns? How, How long is the lifetime of these different materials? Yeah, so, you know, cladding, fuels... I don't want to lessen the importance of materials issues with those types of materials, but those are also materials that are cycled in every or replaced basically every several cycles, right? So every 18 to 24 months, the reactor is shutting down, you're putting some new fuel, you're shuffling fuel around. And basically each of those fuel assemblies cycles through or runs through maybe three cycles before it's finally sort of put out to uh, nuclear waste, right? So materials issues there really only have to hold up for five years, five, six years, right? Um, The more I'd say critical issues are Stuff like the pressure vessels, yeah. which you just can't replace. And why right? not? How come we didn't come up with this paradigm where it's like every 20, we you know, pre-build a nice big hole in your containment, you know, loading dock or yeah. something, and just say every 20 years we're gonna cycle in a new reactor vessel. And you know what? Because it only has to last 20 years, now it's proportionally cheaper. Right. So we really can't afford right. to swap it out every 20 right. years. And that would be brilliant. Yeah. Um, I wish that we did that, right? <laughs> There's just <laughs> <laughs> one of there's several issues associated with that. Um, one it, problem is that this is a massive structure, yeah. right? They um, we were talking yesterday about how they have to be made as a forging, so a, just a, sort of a single piece, this massive structure. Yeah. And the cost of that is just tremendous. <sighs> you know, if we were able to design some sort of a pressure vessel where we could maybe, replace piecewise as, you know, different components got more embrittled, that would really, I think, solve a lot of the issues associated with lifetime of your reactor. That's really kind of the main life limiting piece of your reactor is this pressure vessel at this point. It seems to me like these power plants could literally last forever if you just came up with a schedule to replace structural components. Precisely. Yeah. And, you know, several years ago, there was a lot of research that showed that um, you could apply heat treatment yeah. or annealing to these pressure vessels um, to sort of reduce the effects of radiation on it. So, mm. you know, as radiation um, exposure accumulates in a pressure vessel, it can get really brittle, right? Mm. And so if you think about... Um, the, the sort of operating margins or safety margins that that the reactor needs to operate within. Um, if the material is more brittle, then it can absorb less um, 
mechanical energy, mechanical stress, right? right. And so that sort of reduces your operating envelope. And this, right? bri- this embrittlement, this brittle nature of the material, what actually is it on the atomic level? Is it really just that there are like all these little spongy gaps within the, uh, the lattice um, structure? It's actually, um, voids are really not the critical issue with pressure vessels. Um, the, the embrittlement issue with pressure vessel steel is that it forms these little clusters of um, different chemical species. So in the alloy itself, it starts out with some some copper, some silicon, some nickel, um, and some manganese within primarily an iron matrix. Mm-hmm. And as you irradiate your material, this uh, copper, nickel, silicon, and manganese, they tend to form tiny little clusters. Do they like each other or do they like themselves more? Copper the doesn't like iron. Okay. Copper doesn't <laughs> like anything. Okay. So copper will Finds tend itself. to find itself. Okay, cool. And then the nickel and silicon and manganese decide, oh, we like copper too. So they will sort they of cluster around cluster it. Around so how does the annealing break that up? So the annealing will tend to um, remove a lot of the radiation damage. So one of the other things that forms is dislocation loops, right? So these are sort of immovable obstacles in your material, Um, I guess sort of faults in the material. And the annealing process will essentially get rid of a lot of these dislocation loops. So um, the dislocation loops are really sort of, um, I guess, taken out of the picture as Mm. an embrittlement riddling uh, feature. Mm. So um, even if the annealing cannot get rid of all of those little copper and nickel precipitates, can at least get rid of a lot of um, the the dislocation loops that cause a lot of embrittlement Mm. in your material. If you're able to do that, that would be wonderful. You can buy yourself a lot more time of operating the reactor, right, with that pressure vessel. The problem is how are you going to anneal this you know, what, 20 foot structure, yeah. right? It's just not possible. Yeah. So um, that's really where, you know, if we were able to sort of take pieces off, or, yeah. you know, detach different pieces of a pressure vessel, that would sort of solve a lot of issues. Not only could you replace things more easily, but you could also anneal and um, preserve materials, right? Yeah, it seems to me, yeah, I spoke about this yesterday, so maybe you could comment on it a little bit further, but it seems to me if we got rid of this forging requirement, yeah, um, we could simply uh, bring in pieces of a reactor vessel, exactly. weld it potentially on site, there, you can take, you know, so it'd be easy to bring in, easy to disassemble mm-hmm. later, or, mm-hmm. you know, you could even chop up the old one, get it out the door without breaking the total containment structure. You could bring in other ones in pieces or plates or rolled plates, uh, weld them together, assemble the thing up and say, yes, we know welding isn't as great as forging. So we're going to do this every 20 years. But you know what? Instead of it costing 150 million, it's going to cost a couple million bucks every exactly. couple, few years. Exactly. So what's the what's the pushback on that? So that's my that's my theory. What's the pushback? Yeah, yeah. Um- Forging is what we've always done, right? That's the <laughs> Don't that's kill what we've me, always right? done. Um, it would be fantastic, right? If we could exactly like you said, bring in pieces of pressure vessels, weld yeah. them on site, be so much cheaper, so much faster. And but certainly, so I it, all right, so we know that welding had its issues early on, 1960s. Mm-hmm. It had the yeah. copper inside, and the copper doesn't like the uh, the copper filler material doesn't like the radiation environment. Okay, we get that. Um, certainly, there have been utilities uh, over the last, you know, I mean, we've had 150 reactors, I guess, over the last 60 years, and you know. 50 of them about have shut down now. Certainly some of them have come to the point where like, oh, if we could just swap out the reactor vessel, this would be great. And then they probably assembled an engineering team and said, what are all our options? Mm -hmm. So what happened when they presented this option of let's just weld the new one on site? Yeah. So um, I guess one of the mechanisms for utilities to propose these sorts of ideas and concepts, common challenges, um, in the U.S., at least, is through the EPRI, the Electric Power Research Institute, right? Yeah. There's sort of a 
an entity that represents all of the utilities. Um, and so EPRI has been looking at um, what do they, what do we do about these pressure vessels? Can we weld them instead of making these massive forgings. Um, and so I'm working with EPRI on a new project awesome. that we have um, where we're exploring electron beam welding. So this is a different novel welding technique. Cool. So unlike the typical arc welding from the 60s and 70s, um, where you see you know, the sparks flying off of the, the welding equipment, right? Um, this is a, an autogenous process, which autogenous. basically means... There's no filler metal cool. in there, okay? So um, you don't have this issue of like different material types or different compliances of materials in there. Yeah. You're just sort of welding one plate to another. Yeah. Um, no filler metal needed. And um, this electron beam welding, it's a relatively low heat input. Uh, it doesn't deposit a lot of heat into your material. And is that because the electron beam acts on such a small volume of material at any given time? Precisely. It's able to, um, it's able to melt that material to itself without creating a stress zone around that melting point? Precisely. Um, a lot of welding techniques will have to have this huge melt pool, and that causes this huge region or huge volume in your material that's affected by a tremendous amount of heat input, right? Um, the electron beam welding is really, really localized, very, very small heat affected zone uh, region. And the heat affected zone is essentially indistinguishable from the non heat affected material. So the, the structure of um, the regular material as, as fabricated is identical to the structure of the welded center, the weld center line and the, the heat affected zone. Um, so you, we now have the technology to create these welds, make welds specifically on pressure vessel steels that don't look any different from a forging if, as if there were no weld there to begin with. Mm -hmm. Right. So why don't we use this? Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, that that's that's a question. That's what we're trying to do with this so, project. Yeah. So what gets us from here to there? So what are you yeah. going to do in the project at the end yeah. of the day? Is it going to yeah. be pr produce a set of example pieces of welded material, run them through some stress tests, and say mm -hmm. and produce a report that says, look, it's just yeah. as strong. Yeah. Um, in short, that's what we're going to do. Okay. Yeah. Sure. So we're doing we're irradiating these materials. Um, the Ultimate irradiation dose, or you know, long over the period of the lifetime of the reactor, um, for pressure vessel materials is relatively low, less yeah. than a displacement per atom or a, a DPA. That's the unit that we talk in. Um, and so, you know, over that that lifetime, it's you know takes however many years, but. In a fast test reactor, we can get that total dose in just a matter of a couple of years. Great. So we'll, you know, do this irradiation, get some samples produced. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll do some fracture testing on it. So trying to understand how much energy that material can absorb mm -hmm. before and after irradiation. Um, specifically, we're going to look at the embrittlement of mm -hmm. that. And we, we test the embrittlement by trying to understand um, we, we vary the test temperature. So, you know, as we're doing this fracture test, um, we can do the fracture test everywhere from like cryogenic temperatures up to several hundred degrees Celsius. Mm. So as that temperature um, is varied, the fracture tough or the, the fracture behavior is going to change. A material at higher temperature can usually absorb a lot more energy than a material at very low temperatures, right? So everybody's seen this. Before it breaks. Before it breaks, right? right? So everyone's seen these experiments in their high school chemistry class where the teacher will dunk something into a thing of uh, liquid nitrogen, or right? And oh, it yeah, shatters yeah. on, like a rose or something, yeah. it'll just shatter on the floor, right? So that sort of illustrates that as you heat something up, things become more ductile, more stretchy. More stretchy, able to absorb a lot more energy, whereas at really cold temperatures, 
um, the, the materials are a lot more brittle. And so if you put any energy into it, yeah. any sort of impact, then they'll just shatter, right? Well, good thing nuclear reactors yeah. operate at high relatively temperatures. high temperatures. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that's essentially what we do to, to test the the embrittlement, the extent of embrittlement of these um, pressure vessel materials. And then what's next after that? When you guys have produced your results, which I'm sure will turn up um, that it's a perfectly healthy material, yeah. um, what 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 becomes of it? So at that point, um, I hope that we can start moving that material through the qualification process. Um, part of our project is to really be attentive to um, pressure vessel codes. This is, you know, specifically the ASME um, pressure vessel codes, making sure that we are sort of following test procedures outlined in that, um, following um, material specifications outlined there. And if we're able to demonstrate that this weld, this this material meets those qualifications, um, th- then, you know, hopefully that sort of gets us on a path to where the NRC we'll say, all right, this is an acceptable technology now to use in reactors. I see. So step number one is run your tests, produce a body of evidence. Step number two is take it to the um, ASME, American Society of Mechanical Engineers, code forming teams or something. Correct, yeah. And then uh, once they write it into a code, that is something then that the NRC, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, can then reference in signing off on any Correct, given technology. Yeah. How long does it take to get through the ASME code making process from um, the day that you have your uh, material handbook ready yeah. to go to the day that it's in their book that they publish? Um, that process would probably take a couple of years, I would say. Why does it take a couple of years? Why can't they just read the paper that you guys produce and yeah. look at the numbers and in two hours say, okay, they did it. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm honestly not sure why. Yeah. Um, Do they have to, um, as part of the co-making process, that they've got to get another lab somewhere else to test it too? That, to- that might be part of it. I, I honestly don't know okay. exactly, you know, what, why things would take so long in the qualification process. And uh, I'm not a super expert on qualification of materials, so... That's kind of a, a side of the industry that I just I am not super familiar. Um, what do these electron beam welders look like physically? Um, so these are sort of large chambers. Um, currently, they're done in a vacuum chamber. Mm. So currently, um, you know, you put your material into this sort of vacuum chamber, pump out the vacuum, and you have an electron beam that. Um, can sort of, you know, you can rotate your specimen or, you know, whatever material you're trying to I see. So the gun thingy stays fixed. Fixed. And then you move move, your metal subject. You know, this, you know, linearly or rotationally, however, yeah. Got it. Cool. Um, Yeah. Great. Yeah. Um, What other kind of stuff do you work on? Um, So we work on a lot of um, sort of cook and look type of projects, right? Where radiate something, look what happens. Um, where do you perform these tests? Where, where are you um, radiating? Things? All over the place. We do a lot of radiations um, at the advanced test reactor in Idaho National Lab. Yeah. Um, but we also do a lot of surrogate irradiations using ion beams um, instead of neutrons. Okay. Um, beyond that, we do a lot of work in the tailoring of mechanical properties, the tailoring of material properties and functionalities using irradiation. Um, so this is one of the one of the sort of things that I think um, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to sort of branch out into um, and I, I think might be kind of a, a future uh, path for nuclear science and technology in general, right? Um, w- in the nuclear industry, we often think of radiation as a damaging process, right? Mm-hmm. It's causing damage to our materials. And we're always trying to figure out how can we mitigate these sort of negative mm-hmm. effects, right? Um, but are there any sort of phenomena that radiation causes in materials that we can harness and use for positive yeah, change? Yeah, flipping the, the script. Material? Right, flipping the Love script. Um, and, you know, 
whether those applications are in nuclear or beyond, right? So, you know, there's a lot of things we can do. We were talking earlier about, can we sort of tailor the material? Can we engineer certain features into a material to make it perform better, right? So, you know, if we understand these phenomena, then certainly we can do that. Um, But we can also sort of use radiation to sort of cause improvements in materials, right? Yeah, almost like, um, like I know in the building construction industry, you normally, you know, one might think of uh, stress or tension as a bad thing, but they've figured out how to use that to pre-stress concrete or or post-tension and actually make the material stronger. So perhaps there's an analogy with radiation where you can pre-radiate something to make it uh, more suitable to to your environment. Exactly, exactly. So, you know, one of the applications that we're, we're looking at in my group specifically is um, lithium ion batteries for energy storage applications. Yeah. Um, the way that these lithium ion batteries function typically is you have some sort of anode material, typically a metal oxide. Um, and then lithium ions will sort of move in and out of this metal oxide as you charge or discharge the battery, right? So the more lithium can be accommodated in that metal oxide, the more charge you can store in Mm. that battery, right? Um, What a lot of research has shown that um, defects in these metal oxides can cause more charge storage or more lithium can move into that material, right? So uh, what we're looking at is can we use a radiation to induce those defects, right? Um, And we've been able to show that, yeah, if you irradiate a material, it really does improve the overall lithium charge storage capacity um, and the the cyclability of the battery, right? So, you know, one of the issues is um, a lot of people, um, like for their phone batteries, phone battery will sort of weaken after several cycles, right? Um, if you can extend that period of of time and, and gain more cycles um, of of full charge storage, that that's better for everybody. Right? Amazing, amazing. Yeah. You know, it's it's just so crazy to me that radiation is when when someone hears it, they typically think of it as a bad thing, right? Yeah. Because here's a uh, you know an example in materials where you know it could be a great thing. But then also, you know, in biology, like right. it's been like, I don't know, a billion procedures have been done. Life-saving procedures have been done with radiation. So radiation has saved a billion lives and uh, killed, I don't know, maybe a hundred people right. ever. Right, In all exactly. of human history. Exactly. I mean, it's so crazy yeah. to me that, you know, that uh, we've kind of characterized radiation as exactly. bad. Exactly. We're so scared yeah. of this term radiation without really knowing what it is right? yeah. and what it can do and what it has done for people. Right? No, radiation needs a facelift. Yes, it needs a whole absolutely. new rebranding. <laughs> it needs a whole marketing team absolutely. just for itself. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. For and sure, you're on the yeah. forefront of yeah. that, forefront of making yeah. radiation great yeah. for materials. Yeah. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, what else do you think that, um, what other applications have you guys kind of drummed up or think that it might have? Yeah, Um, so one thing that we've also thought about doing with it is um, sort of um, from the same perspective, looking at semiconductors. Mm -hmm. Um, Semiconductors use a lot of defects um, to sort of uh, charge or, you know, exchange electrons back and forth. Um, And so that's one potential application space that we're considering as well. Um, and also, um, just metals and ceramics, um, oftentimes we're, we're starting to see that, um, radiation isn't always bad in terms of, you know, we're talking earlier about void swelling, right. And these sort of these bubbles forming in materials, right. And causing this volumetric expansion. Um, there's been a lot of research that has shown that that doesn't always happen. And so trying to understand specifically what irradiation conditions cause Mm. that to happen versus cause the opposite to happen. Um, Can we somehow control um, the way that materials respond to radiation? Um, Another avenue that we're looking at is um, using irradiation to build specific um, features into metals 
um, to then tailor how that material or how that metal deforms, mm. so how it responds to mechanical stress. Yeah. Um, some, some materials will um, respond more uh, in, in different ways to mechanical loading. Um, and if we can create some sort of irradiation defect that will sort of encourage it to, to, to do a certain type of deformation mode. And what are the different deformation modes? Yeah. Like springiness so, yeah. or like, how do you? Well, so oftentimes at, uh, at low temperatures um, in materials uh, or in metals, you can usually get what's called localized deformation. So instead of the whole material deforming, you can get very localized regions of the material deforming in specific ways. So one way that that can happen is called is through this um, mechanism called twinning. And what happens with twinning is that you have so much stress in your material um, that a part of the crystal structure just sort of switches and and sort of turns on its side. Mm. Another mechanism is called a phase transformation. So if you have um, a crystal structure. You build up so much stress that that crystal structure can change its its type, the type of structure that it has. Mm. So um, when you say phase transformation, do you mean like literally inside of a solid material, there might be pressure zones created such that it's like somewhat liquidy inside? Um, pressure zones, exactly. So you're not necessarily creating a liquid in there, but you're creating a different phase. So typically, um, most metals and alloys are either a face-centered cubic or body-centered cubic type of crystal structure. Um, and what can happen under specific loading conditions at low temperatures is that you can change that uh, crystal structure from that face-centered cubic to body-centered cubic or even to another type of crystal structure called the hexagonal close pack structure. Um, and so you just get these sort of bands or, you know, strips through your material um, that are of this different type of structure. Mm. And if you're able to accommodate mechanical load through these mechanisms rather than um, through typical um, dislocation slip and dislocation movement in materials, which is the standard way that deformation happens, um, you can sort of gain on different types of properties. So you can mm -hmm. potentially gain on ductility. You could potentially gain on strength or um, Amazing. toughness. Now, okay, so can you walk me through those different um, crystal structures again? Sure. Um, so like face-centered cubic is the typical structure for um, uh, steels, okay. austenitic steels. And what does that look alloys. like? Can you describe to me what Right, I yeah. So sure. So um, all of the atoms in that structure are arranged like um, in a cube. Okay. okay. So all eight corners of a cube yeah. have an atom sitting on them. And then all of the faces of the cube have an atom sitting on those faces. Okay. okay? So that's the face center and cubic yeah. structure. The body center and cubic structure similarly has eight atoms sitting on the corners of the cube but then there's one atom in the very middle of the cube. Mm. Okay? So instead of having them on the faces, you have this atom centered in the body of your cube. And then this cube pattern repeats in all directions, sort of infinitely, right, um, in, in, in any material. And so... That's that's really the difference between the face centered and body centered. And and this is what gives it its properties for strength, ductility, so exactly on and so forth, for responsiveness to temperature changes. I Precisely. guess. Precisely. And I guess this is like what you know when you see these like ancient Japanese swords, what they were doing by like folding and yes. hammering. They were literally creating layers of different. Am I right, or is this a different thing? Um, is yes, you're exactly right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so they're just like kind of like layering face, body, face, body type thing, or um, essentially yes. Yeah. It, it, they they have these very intricate like marbled structures in a lot of these really uh, historic swords, right? And that marbling is often due to different structures being formed. Um, and if you have all these different structures that that tends to really strengthen your material, right? You, um, a, a body centered interface um, next to a face centered material um, at that interface, things will behave differently, right? Yeah. You can't 
um, if you're deforming a certain way in the in the body centered space, that deformation doesn't necessarily translate across that interface to the the face centered uh, space, right? Um, so you can accommodate mechanical deformation um, differently. And um, is it possible that one day uh, we could irradiate materials so precisely, like you know, by using like you know like wave interferences that like at specific points or like specific planes, we could say, all right, we're going to, you know, we've got this piece of steel. Um, now, you know, every few nanometers or micrometers, whatever it is, we want to put a layer of face. We want to put a layer of butt. Mm -hmm. Is that a possibility mm -hmm. someday? Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, you can really ch uh, change the energy that you're irradiating with, mm -hmm. the type of particles you're irradiating with to induce different, microstructures at different depths in the material, Amazing. right? So Maybe one day we can have our space cool. elevator then. Yeah, if exactly, we get the, yeah. <laughs> right? Like we can really do things right, at that level. Right, right. That'd be cool. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, awesome. Wow, that's a lot to absorb, uh, trying to think of things at that level. So we talked about face, body. Was there, were there any other, you said hexa hexagonal? Hexagonal, yeah. So the hexagonal is, you know, instead of being structured as cubes, you have your crystal is structured like a hexagon or ex actually a hexagonal prism. So you've got a you know ex hexagonal ring on the top, hexagonal ring on the bottom, mm. and then you've got a few atoms sort of in between them. Mm. Which one is ice? Because I know like when water freezes, it becomes ice, lower density, yeah. some different this crystal structure. What is, what's happening? Um, what is ice? <laughs> so ice, um, does not form the same sort of crystal structure because it's made up of um, uh, what is it? Polar molecules, right? Oxy I don't know. I'm not uh -huh. a chemist. You're gonna have to teach me. Oxygen with two hydrogens, right? Yeah. So when you have like metallic bonds or fully ionic bonds, mm -hmm. like in a in a metal or in a ceramic. Um, you can create these crystal structures. I see, with, it's a pure element. Because it's not so much that it's a pure element, but there's the bonding type, right? Okay. Um, you can have isolated ions or atoms that will bond to it within that cubic structure, within that hexagonal structure. Whereas with ice, you can never really isolate the, the two hydrogens from the oxygen, right? Mm. So you have this polar molecule of H2O, and you can't really stack that mm. whole guy right into a, a crystal lattice. So you, I think ice forms just sort of um, kind of amorphously, like um, the as those... Uh, hydrogen, oxygen, uh, things just sort of align. align. Yeah. yeah. I think that's, a, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Yeah. Um, do you mostly look at metals at the end of the day? Um, or are there other materials? Metals and ceramics. Ceramics. Yeah. And yeah. are there applications with ceramics where we could irradiate them to create different properties? Yeah. Um, well, so, you know, our project with... Um, the lithium ion battery stuff that that's a ceramic project. Um, the metal oxide anode material is a typical ceramic structure. Um, there's a lot of um, fuel pro fuels studies that are going on, not so much in my group, but um, where people have seen that you can create tailored ordered microstructures in fuels mm. through radiation. Um, so if we're able to sort of you know, harness that behavior, could you somehow uh, tailor the behavior of, of nuclear fuel? So ah, to prevent swelling or something. Capture fission gas uh -huh. in specific ways, right? Cool. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. Yeah. As we always do, we're yeah. going to wrap up with asking you, you know, how do you see the future of this industry in general? Where do you yeah. think things could be 10 yeah. years from now? Yeah, well, you know, I think that... Um, significant innovation is needed <laughs> um a, a significant sort of change from uh, the status quo right the status quo has gotten us where we're at today mm. um at least in the u.s and i think that um if we sort of make some space for using the most advanced technologies in terms of um 
digitization of reactors, uh, harnessing the latest materials technologies and actually deploying those in reactors. I think you can really change the way that the industry is operated and, and functions in the US. Um, and hopefully other countries will start to see that as well and, and we'll uh, take that on as well. Janelle Larry, thank you so thank much. Thank you. Thanks yeah. for having me.